go. Son of a Pigeon Podcast. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Nate. I'm here. Nate Bernardini in the house. Hell yes. Singer-songwriter from Berlin. Hell yes. Yeah. Welcome, man. What an honor to have you here. Super nice to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's March 25th, I 25th. think. 25th. About 2 p.m. here in Berlin City. Mm-hmm. And hanging out at... In, uh, do you say your name on the show? Yeah, it's Ohad. Okay, but you say it. Yeah, All right. yeah. All right, so I'm saying out here in Ohad's uh, f- flat. Yeah, it's this uh, temporary place in Oikern. And we're sitting here together on his couch. Yeah, real face-to-face interaction. Yeah, we got some microphones here. A little bit. And we're recording everything we're saying through these microphones. Yes, this very moment will be recorded forever and ever and ever. Ever. Unless it all gets deleted at one point in the future where they're yeah. just like, okay, we're just going to start over. And Do you think it's going to be deleted? Psh. I'm going to upload this to maybe at least 10, 10 places who play podcasts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's going to get deleted, but like when you look back in history, there's just times where people in power sort of, yeah, delete the work or that people have been doing. For whatever mm. reason, you know? So This is true. It could happen at one point. I don't know. I just, I don't have complete trust in the powers above us in that sense. Me neither. But I think then the internet is, uh, is a beast that is unstoppable. Totally. We have nothing that we can do against the internet. Of course not. It's bigger than us. A hundred percent. And it's also a great tool. It's an amazing tool. Yeah. I mean, I use it all the time. Yeah. You know, I think you use do it you? as well. Of course. Where I mean, do you use the internet? I, I mean, I'm on <laughs> all these social media platforms, you know, you're putting your music on Spotify and all of those. I mean, the internet wasn't there when I was younger. I mean, I'm assuming you're probably like 30 something. I don't know. Yeah. 33. Almost. Okay, 33. So I'm 37. So like I grew up when there wasn't the internet at all, you know, I still remember us only having phones in the house with cables. Like you didn't even have phones. With cables. You remember those phones that you need to of dial? Course. We had one in the kitchen. Man, you had to wait. You put the number, the nine was the most evil high. You need to wait the longest when it was night. But it was fine because you knew that's what you had to do to make the phone call. And it was kind of meditative as well, putting the, the numbers into that phone, I think. But I still remember the day where my dad came home with wireless f- house phones, you know. I remember those as well. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, I can go anywhere in the house with this wireless thing, you know? And uh, and then the internet came, and then and then you just watch that develop, and emails. I still remember, like, my first class where we were talking about this new thing, emails. Emails. And learning how to have an email account and write an email and blah, blah, blah. And you can have your own name. Mm. It, it must not be your real name. It can be anything else, which is stupid. Yeah. And then, and then something, something. Exactly. Something. Yeah, yeah. I remember I had like, uh, I was using it to sort of like ask anonymous questions to my classmates when I was in fifth or sixth grade. I think it was fifth grade, sixth grade. I can't even remember, but eventually people figured out it was me and it, like you didn't stay anonymous for too long. But I thought that was kind of interesting at the beginning, beginning the the anom- anonymi- anonymity of of the internet, you know, whereas like today it's almost really hard to be anonymous, I think. You think so? I think today there are more people that don't exist on the internet than people that are really exist in the world. Sure, but if they really, if you really want to track who that person is or where it's coming from, like there's there's tools out there. I think where you it's could, easy to do it. Easy to do it. I think that there was probably a time in the past where it wasn't as easy. I could be wrong, but I yeah. have no idea. Yeah, there is some stories uh, about uh, like a hippie group that were active in the seventies and the eighties, mm. and they used to make. Uh, I would say 80% of the world's LSD. They used to actually make it themselves. Oh, yeah. And they started with somehow they smuggled drugs from Afghanistan. And they just had papers for ID. That's what it was, just a paper. So it was really easy for them to fake it. So they can get some other passports and different names. And that's it. No, it's all papers. So if they want to check on you, they need to go through the papers. There are no computers back then. Yeah, true. Mm. And today, yeah, today everything is with your fingerprint, even your phone mm. is with your fingerprint. Sure. It's all going digital. Yeah, digital and big and fast. Mm. Accessible to the masses. Yeah. Like even this podcast that you're doing now, completely unheard of, you know, growing up for me. That yeah, you could this podcast. That you could have these these expensive microphones that are affordable to the middle class, record it. 
put it onto this platform that the entire world could potentially access mm -hmm. and listen to it anywhere in the world. I mean, that was something yeah. something you probably saw on TV. You know, you heard it on the radio. But to think, oh, I could have access to that microphone, to that channel, to that world audience was yeah unfathomable. Yeah, it was way more expensive back then. Even to make music was so different uh, back then. And music videos, you know. Oh, yeah, man. Like I, I do an event on this coming Monday, Support Local Music, Kino Edition is going to take place in Sputnik. And we just rent out a cinema and play an hour's worth of Berlin-based music videos. And I'm blown away every single time at the level of cinematic quality, both audibly and visually, that the artists in Berlin are producing. I mean, this these productions would be impossible to do, especially on a financial from a financial standpoint, 20 years ago, you know. And now you can just do it. You get an, a, a decent camera for a thousand euros. Okay, it sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of value that comes into making these productions and it ends up paying off in some way, shape or form if you're using it in a the right way. But I just find it amazing that you're able to make these these videos and they look just as good as the music videos I used to watch on VH1 and MTV growing up. If not better. If not better. You know, and used to watch VH1 and MTV and think, oh, the idea of my music video, I mean, even creating one impossible, it being on something that the world could access, in, impossible, you know. And now today is it just super, I mean, it's just normal. It's going to become more and more a part of, uh, yeah, this the typical thing that people can do. And then people take it for granted and they don't even realize how incredible these tools are and how, and how it quickly they uh sort of became mass produced and put into the hands of of millions and transformed the way that we communicate and form culture connect to community the speed of connection is also quite interesting yeah how fast we can communicate with each other yes yeah, so i was thinking about this i was that you asked me what it is i wanted to talk about today and uh i was thinking maybe we could talk about something i've been thinking about lately is uh the laws of nature right so like we just talked about the internet and emails microphones yeah, uploading right i mean these are all things that human beings have extended to we've 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 extended these abilities to our, to the abilities that nature gave us right nature obviously gave us the ability to communicate nature obviously gave us the ability to uh create culture right i think culture is kind of been as a as created as is it's a kind of different entity i would say right but it's a, it's something that nature allows us to do right? yeah for sure what do i mean by that so like, what i mean is uh so not uh, culture <clears throat> from a very simplistic standpoint is nothing more than shared knowledge like if i tell you a popular name like ed sheeran you know you're gonna say oh yeah i know him right but if i say uh Jack Willickson, you're like, oh, I don't know him, right? So that's maybe not a cultural name, right? So, the, what, but whether or not that name's going to be thrown into the the worldwide cultural box or from a local standpoint, right? Like names like Scott Hildebrand or Jesse Monk, if you know some of these Berlin-based songwriters, uh, they don't have a a world. They don't. They're not really known worldwide, but they still have a cultural influence in berlin right and obviously in the in the internet world but then it's not really global it's sort of scattered you know we're like we tend to call we think we think we're like so you know it's putting we're putting it on the internet and therefore it has a global influence but really the things that have a really truly a global influence are the are the people who are who have access to the channels that sort of without the world wanting to know who ed sheeran is we figure we find out who he is Right. I wasn't looking for Ed Sheeran. Because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And then eventually it just happens, you know, and then people start talking about it. And the next thing you know, it becomes common knowledge all over the world and everybody knows it. Right. But that was, but that's, but that we've bent the laws of nature in that sense to, to spread information that quickly because it used to be a much slower process. Uh, but nature allowed us to, to communicate and spread knowledge and to create culture. In other words, to spread common knowledge within a localized area over a period of time that would then reflect the identity of the people living within that localized area, right? 
or there wasn't political borders, you know, communities were just meeting, talking, uh, and just intuitively creating culture without them really wanting to do that because we have long-term memory, right? So once a group of people experience something at the same time, it stays in the, in the minds of those people for a long period of time until they die, right? If it's if it's a really impactful experience, I will remember that until I die, right? Yeah. And and if that's shared among a, a community of people, uh, then it becomes a cultural then it becomes cultural knowledge, right? A secret that I have to tell you about the person living in the hut next to me isn't cultural, right? I mean that's the I saw him cheating on his wife, and I'm gonna now. This is very cultural, though. Uh, but some it's, cultures they they have open relationships, so it's like, oh, I've seen your husband having sex with the sure, sure, woman, sure, and then the woman, oh, this is nice, How sure. Is but gossip isn't necessarily a reflection of culture, is what I'm saying, right? It's 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 the experiences, the shared knowledge that everybody knows, that 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 make it cultural, right, and not just something uh, in in the in in this gossip box, you know. And uh, and so the ways that we form culture and built upon community for most of uh, of human existence happened without the additional tools that we have added to the human experience in the past couple hundred years, and it really starts with the discovery of electromagnetic waves in eighteen eighty six. Yeah, you think it did not start it even earlier when we discovered how we can extract iron from soil and to create those really strong tools that can help us? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the spreading of knowledge, right? Because we're talking about the, the shared knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Then that's basically a reflection of your culture, right? So how do, I, how do I spread that information faster so that everybody in the world can know it and I can create a world culture? Well, I think uh, before or, that, we, we need to stop on the, on the term, what is a culture? So like I, like I just said, uh, shared knowledge. So anything that's shared knowledge is cultural. But whether or not that shared knowledge goes worldwide or from a local standpoint varies, right? So you have your local culture, which was what you only had before. There was no world culture, right? When Beethoven was writing his masterpieces, there was only a small percentage of the world who was hearing da 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 There was no recording, right? Yeah. So it was the only people who could hear that music were the ones sharing time and space with Beethoven in these exclusive uh, concerts, you know, for the elite. Yeah, you think they did not, uh, like, sold the rights to play it in other way, in other places, where they give them the notes? Well, they definitely wrote down the music. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a, 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 a very advanced society, advanced culture, a, um, advanced cities, you know. I mean, we were by no means primitive at the time in which Beethoven was living, but because you, you could you could write down music, obviously. But for me to send that music all over the world, even even in a written form, it just you just didn't have the tools to do it as fast as you do today, right? So Yeah, that's for sure. So that's what I mean. So you didn't have the ability to influence outside of your space. Right? Whereas like now we're very it's very easy to influence outside of the space that I'm in. Like right now, you and I are the only ones in this space, but because of this microphone, we're giving other listeners the access to listen to what we're saying without sharing time or space with us, right? So that like the, what you're hearing right now, listener, isn't really happening. It's a recording from the past that allows you to listen to what I said on March 25th, 2023 with Ohad in his room, right? Yeah. But without this technology, it would only be shared among us. Yeah, exactly. The the audible part of it, right? And then you could obviously then pass it down by word of mouth, but you would never be able to pass it on at the speed at which technology is able to do it, right? So, and you can't really, and I don't think it's a negative thing though, the speed of in which information can be spread, but I find it interesting the way in which it changes the dynamics of communication and culture and community, right? And and I feel like the more that it becomes so routine and common to do these things that we we tend to forget what has happened right so like for example like i uh wanted if if for example i left my phone at your place right and then i leave and oh no i can't say my phone let's just say i leave i left my my wallet here right and right. i had like five hundred dollars here and it was like eighteen eighteen fifty 
and I lived across this the across the 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 city. Okay, there is no streetcars. I have to take a. I got a to get horse, a horse, probably, or right? Of course, a walk. So I'm in the horse. I'm in this little buggy going across the city, and then I realize, oh, my wallet with my with my five hundred dollars is in my. I left it at Ohad's place. Uh, turning around is not possible. I can't call you, right? No. So I, it's impossible for me to interrupt where you are with my voice if I'm not there, right? So you just had to say, okay, or if like to say you're getting in an argument with your partner, right? And your partner is like, it's this on her mind or it's on his mind. And they and they call you at that sort of moment in which oh, I just need to get this off my chest. I'm going to call this person now. And you call that person while they're having dinner with friends. Yeah. And you answer it because it's your partner and you walk in the other room. And then all of a sudden this person is distracting you with their voice and pulling you away from your experience there with your friends at the table. And not to say that's a negative thing, but it would be impossible to do without that technology. Yeah. Which means you would have to just wait until I come home or until we meet again. And then you can then tell me what it is you want to tell me, right? Yeah, exactly. So this changes the dynamics of, of everything, you know? Like telephones made it possible for long-term relationships to, to thrive, Right, because before people were obviously having long term relationships, but then they were writing letters back and forth. And with the introduction of the telephone, it it revolutionized the way in which relationships were able to be sustained at a distance. But it still didn't completely fulfill it in the sense where it's like, Oh, we can just stay at a distance forever. I don't the phone fulfills all my needs. Obviously it only it paralyzes the the holistic human experience of connection. To a certain degree, I can hear your voice, but I can't touch you. I can't smell you. Uh, you know, I can't really see you either. You know, I might have a picture of you on my wall or something. But even photographs are are pretty fairly new technology. You had to paint people for most. Of- yeah, it's fairly new, like three hundred years, two hundred years. Yeah, something like that. Right. So you, know, if you wanted to see what somebody looks like, you either had to paint them and then share with somebody that painting. If the painting was good. If the painting was good, or you had to stand in front of that person, and that was it. And the same thing goes for for these priceless pieces of art, right? If I had the Mona Lisa, and I wanted to see it, I had to go and stand in front of it, and yeah. that, it wasn't going to be copied and scanned and digitalized and put everywhere so that every person in the, in a matter of seconds can see a picture of the Mona Lisa. Those are incredible tools. And I'm not trying to say it's not a, a positive thing, but I find the dynamic of these things, like I said, interesting. And uh, so, yeah, like, um, so I wrote this song. <laughs> That's the moment we're waiting for. Yeah, so I, I have like a, 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 a series of songs all right. that are all sort of connected to this topic. So wait, before you start, I would like to get okay. some room mic. Okay. This is the special sauce for those of you who record stuff and I, they want to get some some techniques. I'll you know? tell you I'll tell you some of the background of this story. So I I looked online mm-hmm. recently what are the conditions to be classified as a living organism? I think you need to reproduce. Yes, that's one. That's one of one. one of seven. And it's interesting you have to have all seven of these conditions to be classified as living. And if one of them is not there then you're a non-living Seven object. conditions. Yeah, to being classified from a scientific standpoint as a as a living thing. So one of them is to reproduce. Yes. Um, emotions can be also one of them. I, I don't think so because if it's scientific. I mean, this is just to, to say, okay, you're living or not. So like, definitely, you have to have all living things have the have the potential to give to offspring. Um, they grow and and develop. They that's, grow and develop. That's three. All right. Um, they consume energy. Makes sense. Um, they have to be con- made w- of cells. Okay. All right. So all living things are made of cells. But not biological cells. It doesn't have to be. No, you have to be made of cells. All living things are made of cells. But we talk about biological cells, so you can make it like as electronic cells. You know what I mean? If, if you're a robot, you're also made from cells. But sure, but then it's a non-living organic. thing because a robot can't reproduce. Yeah, this is not true. 
They can't reproduce. They can. Robots can can have intercourse and reproduce and create offspring. I don't think they can have intercourse, but I think they can reproduce. They can't create offspring. No way. Why not? Because they don't. Because it's, it's a non living thing. It's. I mean, it's not made of living cells. It doesn't grow and and uh, develop. It doesn't adapt to its environment. It doesn't respond. These are all the the main things. Anyways, I just find it kind of interesting. These are the the seven conditions to to living. And I wanted to put those things in a song. Can I play it now or? Yeah, it's kind of a new song. I've only played it um a few times and the lyrics aren't like completely done, but you just have to keep playing it over and over again and eventually it's something sticks. Almost there. All right. All right, Ohad is setting up another Go for it. microphone. Now can only be here. Here can only be local. Local can only be now. But now no longer needs local. I can hear you where you are. No distance too far. I could see you if you'd stand right now in Japan. It's in our nature to bend the laws of nature. And here's the conditions. The locals are living among us. Life gives to offspring. Offspring grows and develops. Adapts when the winter turns spring. Cells are essential to live. We're lifeless without energy. Life is responding. Dead is the precious touch screen. It's in our nature. in our nature to bend the laws of nature there's a new song called the laws of nature Yowza. <laughs> yeah so i the, i was telling a friend of mine recently i was on a connor uh kill kelly he's another songwriter in berlin he does a show at 800 a it's a bar in berlin called Ooh, what is it called again it's not the ping pong i can't remember the name of the show it's, but anyways he at, i told him that um the music only happens in real time and space and that the music that you're listening on your phone on your headphones isn't really happening right now right music really only happens in real time and space. And when you're listening to it, that music isn't really happening. Right? Kind of, yeah. I mean, obviously you're hearing music, but it's not happening. You're hearing a recording of something of music, but there's not yeah. somebody actually playing guitar at that moment. There's not somebody actually singing in that moment. It's a it's a recording of somebody singing in the past. Yeah, it's a snapshot of a moment. Exactly. But in if if I was to say in 1850, music only happens in real time and space, yeah. everybody would say, of course. It wouldn't be a philosophical topic. Yeah, very true. So you would just accept it because that's what the laws of nature say. If I want to hear somebody's voice, I need to be sharing space with them. Of course. 1850, that's not a deep thing to say. That's a, just a, a normal observant thing of nature, a law of nature that you're just expressing, right? Yeah. And so people had, uh, were basically because there was no other, no, there was no other extension to the to bending these laws yet. 
that you had a perception of reality, a perception of living, that you you were forced to have. And today you have the option, right? Before you didn't have the option to hear the voice of somebody I'm not sharing space with, right? Somebody told me recently, I listen mostly to music by people who are dead. If I said that sentence in 1850, you'd be crazy. Yeah, for sure, man. Right. But today I can say I listen mostly to artists who are dead. I listen to their voices singing and they're all dead. Impossible 200 years ago, right? Um... So yeah, these these laws have all been bent in a in a in a valuable way. Obviously, it's in, it's incredibly valuable to be able to hear the music of people all over the world, how they sang, the kind of music that they made, those parts of the world, blah blah blah. It's all amazing. But what's interesting is how it disconnects us from those laws of nature, and that when you talk about those laws of nature that are still intact because you can't get rid of them. It's now seen as something deep and philosophical. What do you mean when you come back to our our regions and how we used to be before technology started to really take accelerating speed? So um, let's start with electricity, okay? Yeah. So since human beings could start uh, perceiving their environment, they noticed that there's this thing coming out of the sky. And hitting the ground. But they didn't call it that, right? They didn't call it electricity. They called it who knows what, you know? But everybody around the world saw that. Yeah, probably they had a god for this. Who knows? Yeah, there was also a, a, an assumption that it was the gods punishing the people, you know? That you had to come, come up with an explanation to these things. And it definitely wasn't scientific, you know, for most mm-hmm. of human history. It was the spirit of the sky. Right. And the scientific movement uh, sort of starts putting making sense of these things right so you're taking this mystic out of the equation and and putting and replacing it with with science right yeah with logic so it starts with the in the antiquity times with rubbing amber in german bernstein uh with fur and it attracting bits of hay onto the stone, right? And this stone in old Greek is called electron. And this is the root of the word electricity and electron. And with this stone, you create a spark. No, 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 no. This is static electricity. All right. Right. So they, they notice that there is this thing coming out of the sky. And then they also notice that there is this sort of attraction. And it starts with, Bernstein or amber and hay getting a- attached to it oh, okay. when like I rub it. Magnetic field force. Just like a balloon on your yeah, head, exactly. right? Like, why does that? It's all static electricity. Obviously, they didn't have balloons back then, but they had a similar uh, thing happen with this stone, right? And it, it was only this stone and that they just found that interesting. So time goes on. People still don't know what this thing is, right? And then Benjamin Franklin comes along. And for the first time is able to contain the power of electricity in a conductor. And for the first time, humanity says, okay, now that we have it in a cage, what can we do with it? Right? And then it starts, you know, at this point, you don't even have light bulbs and things like this. Thomas Edison comes no, not uh, yeah. Thomas Edison yeah, comes later. Yeah. yeah, he comes later. You know, he did not invent it. it, it no, he did not. He did not invent. He the, took the rights for it. Well, he he invented one that was much more accessible and easy, like not less dangerous and things like this. There was other bulbs being used at the time that were oil based. Yeah, and uh, they were being used to light up the streets, and then I think they eventually became electric as well. But they were really, really hot. And they they weren't very sustainable, and then and then he comes out with these with this with this light bulb, and it it then takes over the whole world, right? Yeah. And and how it's that like the iPad back then, huh? Exactly. Imagine but this. the dynamic of this, right? So like up until this point, houses all over the world are only lighting their homes with gas lamps, yeah, or candles, or candles. All right, so I got another song for this. 
Yeah, go for it, wait, wait. Hey, hey get okay. the other mic. Okay. But what I was going to say, so I, around Christmas time, I went and got a, uh, I got this like box of old newspaper uh, articles from the 1930s from the Berlino Post. It was in German? All in German. Are from, you German at all? No, 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 no. You come from the US, right? I come from the US, yeah. But I've been in Germany for 17 years. Okay. So I can read this stuff. And I find it quite interesting, you know, just having that old piece of... Because the thing, the, the whole perception of life is much different in 1933, right? So on the back of this, of this article, so on the, they had this sort of featured article where they would always present something related to natural sciences, to natural science maybe physics or biology. And there was a picture, a colored picture on the one side, and it talked about electricity, exactly what I just said, like static electricity, electricity from the sky, and then the light bulb, right? It's all, it's all related to the same stuff. Yeah. But it's just a development of it, right? And on the back of it, it said that electricity is this primal force that has taken over the world, right? Um, and I, my friend read this and he said, oh, it's really philosophical. And I thought, no, it's scientific, right? If I would say fire is a primal force, no question. That's not philosophical. You would be like, of course it's a fire. But electricity is just as primal as elect as, as fire, right? But we didn't have a, we weren't able to control it until much later, right? Yeah. Human beings already sort of mastered and, and controlled fire far before electricity. Right, but electricity stated this mysterious thing, right? It still is mysterious. We know how to control it, but we don't really know what is it. Oh, well, I mean, it's electrons moving between between atoms. So you basically like every atom has uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons, yeah. right? And every atom is is associated with one of the elements in the in the periodic table, right? So if I break yeah. if I break down this table and, and t- from the molecules down to the atoms and then say, okay, well, this atom has X amount of protons, X amount of neutrons, um, and the electrons, then it must be this atom belonging to this element. And, and the electrons then jump in between these atoms. And when it does that, it creates a stream of electrons that, that is basically electricity. Yeah, this is the, the way it happens, but what is it exactly? Why does the electrons flow to different materials? Why they have this movement? I mean, I think I guarantee all of these things could be answered online, yeah. but uh, probably hundred percent, hundred percent. But so this is just like a, so I don't really think you need to be like super scientific and uh, a master at, at these things, or you know all the mathematical equations, just to have a basic understanding that electricity is a primal force of nature, right? Yeah, for sure, and that should not be philosophical at in any way shape or form right all right so this song is called uh oberlin oberlin got electricity back in 18 91 and the horses They didn't have to work Cause the street cars took away their job And the candle turned in to a flame You had if you paid Berlin was so happy to see their dark streets come to life cause even when the sun went down you could stay out as if it never did Caused all the cities in the world to never shut their eyes. Oh, Berlin, I picked 
picked up your paper from 1933 And they called it a primal force A product of nature, of course Product of nature, of course. Called it a man, they called it a primal force. Product of nature, of course. Oh, yeah, but physics was the pioneer that brought us all here. Wouldn't be the same without all the things we plug in. It all needs that magical stuff. It's a topic not often discussed. Or did we forget? What turns everything on is electrons. Oh, Berlin, I want you to know that this magic, it's everywhere. Even scientific proof There's atoms in me and in you Electrons moving between We're electric beings Electricity when the Big Bang sparked a light. The electricity. Yeah, well, I just find it interesting for how it used to just be a thing of nature, you know, like there was, it wasn't this thing that you plugged anything into, it wasn't being used for to generate products. Right, it was just this thing of nature for most of human existence. Everything is electricity, in my opinion. But they didn't know that for most of human existence. That's no, they did not know that. Yeah. So for physics, used to separate uh, the electric field from the magnetic field, and there was there was fields in both of these categories, and then they realized later that everything is electromagnetic, and that you that there is no only electric and only magnetic. It's always connected. Yeah, this is insane, huh? And this happens in the 1800s, at the end of the 1800s. And this is what, this discovery is what leads to the speed of information. Yeah, I agree about this. Right, so I wrote a song about this one too. Oh man, you're just hitting with those songs. Yeah, it's, I think it's a... EM waves, electric, magnetic waves, they are invisible to the human eye, all but for one visible light, radio, micro, Infrared, and then the one we see, it comes from the sun, has to all the rest.
across the whole spectrum. Ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma waves are the dangerous ones because they ionize. They break apart cells and can take away lives. The internet, GPS, TV sets, and even nuclear bombs would never exist without Heinrich Herr. In 1886, discovering electric, magnetic waves. Now they go where we go with our mobile phones, transceiving microwaves through time and space. So many. Em waves we don't see in this place. Do you know electromagnetic waves? You- yeah, a little bit. I had a friend told me recently. She's like, "Yeah, you sing this song. I have no idea what you're talking about." I thought it was funny. She's like, "I just don't understand what this song is about." It what made, is electromagnetic waves? Well, it's interesting because, like I said, they didn't they didn't know that they existed, right? For for even though science it was pretty advanced at the time. Um, and then this this physicist named James Clerk Maxwell, I think it's his name, comes out with this equation that would prove that electromagnetic waves exist, but it's only theoretical, right? But he has this equation. And the academic world is looking for somebody who can use this equation to prove his hypothesis. And there's this uh, mathematician, Heinrich Herz, who's living in Germany. And he sort of gets pushed by his professor to, to try to solve this yeah, challenge, you know. And he's the first one to, to construct like, uh, basically a, an antenna. And pull the electric magnetic power from nature and channel it to this antenna. It's only like a meter away, right? But he basically proves that they exist and says, I have no idea what you're going to use this technology for or what you're going to use this information for. But James Clerk Maxwell was right, right? They exist. And then this opens up the floodgates to the modern world. Yeah. So they come up with radio. Obviously, the telephone is still is already being used at this time. I'm but pretty sure. But it was more wires. Telephone. I'm not sure when did the micro when did the telephone come into. Uh, I think also uh, it was this Graham Bell. He was the inventor of the telephone. But I think also yeah, that was Thomas before. Edison was the first uh, who made the recording yeah, system exactly. really mainstream as well. Right. So they had a way to sort of channel your voice. Yeah. Through the telephone, I guess. If I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I, th- I think that's right. By 1886, definitely right. And then, um, and then the le- the discovery of electromagnetic waves. What they realized was, depending on the frequency of this, the exact same thing, right? It's the same thing, and the faster that I move it, its properties change, right? So yeah. it, a radio wave has very long wavelengths, right? And uh, and then as it goes faster, those wave those waves become smaller and smaller, and and then they realize there's a whole spectrum that these waves uh, produce, right? So it starts with radio waves, and if it move it a little bit faster, they become microwaves, and then it becomes infrared, and that's what some snakes can see. Some snakes can see infrared. We our eyes don't work this way, and then after that. There's a small percentage of the scale called visible light. And that's the reason why I can see you in this room and that, and that light. Everything that is shedding light on everything we see is an electromagnetic wave. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to have this title, right? But it's interesting to think that the light that you're seeing right now is the exact 
from the substance the exact same thing as the the microwave that's being used by the listener right now to listen to what we're saying somewhere else in the world by contracting this information on the internet, right? But it's the same thing, just moving a bit faster. And then all of a sudden for our eyes, I mean, it would, it would start glowing for a snake before it started glowing for us. It would start glowing and then, oh, there's visible light. And you make that go even faster, the light fades and it becomes ultraviolet. Yeah, And this is what causes us to be, get our tans in the summer, right? And the reason why they're more dangerous is because they ionize, so they, they, they can damage your cells. And that's why you get a tan, right? But you obviously don't want to be under those ultraviolet rays for too long because they, as we know, lead to skin cancer. But if I then make that go even faster, I then bring an electric magnetic wave to Earth that was never intended to be on Earth. They exist in the in space, but they would never exist on Earth. For and what reason? Because there's there's nothing that's that's moving an ultraviolet wave faster on Earth, right? So they they science con- constructed, I think it was an accident, right? So Rotigen, this German physicist, I believe, accidentally discovered uh, X rays right by basically just turning up the free it didn't he didn't know this right i think i think he used you have to look it up online right i don't like i said i don't really think you need to know be a scientist to understand these things right it's just the the amount of uh science and research and mathematical understanding that was required to, to for for these sentences to be said and backed behind something that's 100 percent true is, is you don't necessarily need to have that knowledge or that ability the mathematical understanding to know that electric magnetic waves exist and how they sort of function in the spectrum and why it becomes non-ionizing up until ultraviolet and then after starting an ultraviolet it starts ionizing and damaging cells and then it goes faster and then it goes to x-rays right Mm-hmm. And they and X rays also ionize, but even more so than ultraviolet. But human beings at the time didn't know this. They thought it was just amazing that I can see my bones. It is pretty amazing. Totally. And imagine uh, the first person who ever saw this. The, so the first person who saw this was Rotigan's wife. He took a he took a X ray of his wife's hand wearing her wedding ring. And that, that, that picture went around the world, and then x-rays became this, this sensation that everybody wanted to sort of experience. Oh, so yes. they were creating little boxes, for example, and, and putting x-ray boxes, putting them into shoe stores so that I could put my shoe on, put it into this box, and see if my bones are fitting into the shoe the way that I want them to. This is nice. Totally. It's but very nice. But then they started realizing these have health Impli- implication. How long did it take them to realize that? Not too long, I don't think, right? So they were doing these things. There was all these like talk about x rays, blah, 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 blah. And then they started f- realizing people are getting, are, you know, getting sick from this. I couldn't tell you exactly what the consequences were, but they definitely weren't, weren't pleasant. And so they uh, then started only do- giving people x rays with protection. Like the people who at the dentist, they always wear these heavy lead. Yeah. Right. And then they, they shoot basically this electromagnetic wave moving at the surf at certain frequency, the exact same stuff as a radio wave, the exact same stuff as the light, just faster. At the speed of light, it all moves at the speed of light. So electric magnetic waves, all of them move at the speed of light, just like visual light. They move in the speed of light, but they have different frequencies. That's right. So the, the light basically is the carrier, but the information they have inside of them is something else. Well, the, the, the information inside is like the, the, the essence of an electric magnetic wave is the same regardless of where it is in the spectrum. The only thing that changes is the, is the frequency. So I'm mo- moving those waves faster. Right? If I took a rope and sort of like a, waved it up and down slowly, that would be like a yeah. radio wave. And then if I was like waving it back and forth faster, 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 a jump rope, then that would be sort of maybe x-rays, you know? All right. Maybe one way to look at it. 
so yeah they get rid of these thing these these contraptions and you know they're realizing okay x-rays are are dangerous and blah 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 and then they they realize okay it's all connected to the same stuff right so when heinrich hertz discovered these waves they didn't know there was a whole spectrum and there was already a lot of scientific research being done around the question what is light right isaac newton was sort of the pioneer the, the pioneer uh physicist in in shedding some understanding on what light is but he didn't he not even he understood that it's an electric magnetic wave and and everything that comes on on the other side of the spectrum when when visible light is right in the middle and it's only a small fraction of the whole thing mm -hmm. so if i could see all the electric magnetic waves right now in this room it would be a mess i wouldn't see you you'd be a i'd be it'd be like a foggy room and i would have to go up to your nose to see your face but they're everywhere right now yeah definitely so yeah and then, and then they then they discovered gamma waves right yeah even faster even faster and then these are the waves i believe that are used for like atomic bombs and things like this right so like i said it all starts with with heinrich hertz in 1886 and then and this is the same guy that we say hertz right when we talk about frequencies right exactly right so they were going to call the, these waves hertz waves at the beginning yeah but then when they realized there was a whole spectrum and they it was it was too complicated to call it all hertz waves they they used that name hertz for the frequency rather yeah. to measure it and then labeled the the them radio waves and microwaves and so on and so forth yeah hertz basically it's how many cycles the wave has been done in a second it's how many times the wave in yeah exactly yeah moves in a second so you're like yeah it's this amount of yeah wave goes up and it goes down so exactly. it starts in a, in a zero and then it goes up 180 degrees and then it goes back to zero and then it goes down minus 180 degrees right so you can imagine it as a waveform which goes up and down but you can also imagine it as a circle they right. always go with the circle so there are two ways you can imagine this yeah and everything is basically frequency when we go to the to the most essence of life and about everything everything is in the end the frequency and it's just a matter of how these frequencies interact with each other and i think this is what is so epic about music and it's so beautiful that you started with this subject i think this is the most scientific podcast i have ever had <laughs> with any science well i'm not a scientist so but a scientist yeah that's the word but yeah i just did i mean it's amazing the you basically have a library in your pocket, you know, yeah. like a hundred years ago or 50 or 20 years ago, I had to go to the library to you start. You more than this in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, of course. This tool is incredible. Totally. Uh, but what I wanted to say is music is, for example, one way that we can harness this beautiful harmony of the universe. You know, music is something that we did not create. It's something that we discovered. We did not create third harmonic, you know, like a major third or minor third. We did not create a perfect fifth. They were there the whole time. We just mm. had to discover it. And, and and this is what really fucks me up every time I think about it. Because how is it possible that if we have those uh, uh, intervals and in a certain in a certain way we play that in a certain pattern, it makes us feel certain emotions. It can make us feel happy if we make it a bit uh, major or in a different... Uh, in a different tempo, it can make us feel very sad and emotional. Mm. And, and this is something that is so incredible. And I cannot explain this. This is remain as a mystery for me. I mean, what I find interesting about music from a primal standpoint is the mm -hmm. function that it has for human beings uh, when, you're, when, there's no, when there's not a capitalistic system, there's no political system yet. There's not even an understanding of mathematics the way that we have it today, whereas, like you said, it's a 4-4 four, four signature, and it has this many bars, and it's going to do this, and it's going to do that, right? It's all, it's all becomes, the, the more that, the, that human beings master and understand mathematics, the, the more advanced our abilities become, right? Yeah. And the same thing happened with music. Like you, you were able to do things that you weren't able to do before because you understand it's all sort of it's all connected to math in some way but when you don't have that understanding of it and you could still do this today like i was saying these these developments never obliviated the laws of nature yeah for sure but However, there, is, there is an order when everything it makes more sense when there is a certain order right you can have a beach 
which is sand, but you can have also a sand castle. It's the same sand, but it's just in a different order. And this order makes it more pleasing to observe. You know, if you see a castle in the sand, you say, wow, someone made an effort. And it's the same with music. You can have frequencies, you can have melodies that right. can make no sense. But the moment that we actually put it into an order, mm. and we don't have to call it a perfect fifth, but it's the feeling that mm. once you play those two frequencies together, you get the, a third frequency that is very satisfying. Yeah, And it doesn't happen if you if you detuned in half a step uh, or even a quarter of a step or eight of a step, mm. it just sounds bad. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but my point was from a primal standpoint, nobody was thinking this way. No, they were feeling this. Yeah, so my, my theory yeah. th to this is that human beings at one point became aware of their heartbeat. Maybe they put their hand on their chest, <laughs> right? And they were just like, oh, it's going... Bah, 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 bah. And then they were like... Bah. And then everybody was like, ba 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 Stay in your groove, man. Right, but there wasn't like, oh, I'm going to take my awareness. This is just my assumption. It's a theory. I'm going to take my awareness of my heartbeat, and then I'm going to become like a superstar and brand myself and make money off of music and da-da-da. They just realized, hey, this is something that's fun. This is something that's connecting us. They, were, they weren't thinking this, I'm assuming. They're probably just doing it intuitively. I think it was even... even uh way more further than our bodies i think we became even more aware of other animals and what kind of sounds they made and we tried to imitate that mm -hmm. and i think uh, if you go to see a lot of uh, ancient cultures that are still active today you can see that in the way they dress they have all those colors sometimes they want to be like uh, the animals around them uh, maybe they get inspired by the animals um, and also the, the sounds for sure the sounds right so i was i was telling somebody recently like we were sitting there in the kitchen playing music and there was nothing being plugged in, right? It was a stand-up bass, an acoustic guitar, our vocal cords vibrating in the air, right? Vol molecules of the air, which is, it's interesting, Phys physics found out uh, in the 17th, 18th century by a guy, a guy named Robert Boyle that you need air in order to have sound. And he basically took a, like a, a, a glass cylinder, vacuumed out the air and rang a bell in it and there was no sound right so anyways it's vibrating these molecules in the air and these these air these molecules are then vibrating in our ears yeah and it's creating this sound and once we stop talking it returns to silence right and you didn't it didn't repeat right the, these microphones allow then for the first time for music to repeat exactly the same way that i performed it before right Otherwise, for most of human history, nothing repeated audibly. Yeah. You could obviously say the same thing again, but the exact same thing never repeated itself. Yeah. And so every music was something that was temporal, just like your voice. Anything audible is, is a temporal uh, per, uh, creation of, I don't know, vibrations, I don't know. But uh, it's not like if I'm a, if I'm a uh, carpenter, I create a, a, this table. And uh, I take the elements around me, put it together, and I create this 3D structure in the 3D world that sits there, right? But me as a songwriter, I'm not working with materials, I'm working with frequencies, right? Consciously or subconsciously, yeah. that's what you're doing, right? Your vibrations, that's all it is. And then she's like, oh, this is like so deep. Is this actually recording? Or? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, it's so deep. I was like, why is it deep? Why did why why does why why what has happened among humanity today that if once you start talking about the laws of nature the way in which we did it, it becomes philosophical I, I find this quite interesting so I wrote a song about this too hell yes uh, and it's about uh, music. Uh, always having to end with silence and it's called where it belongs i hope that you're doing good it's been a long time the echo of the two of us still ripples through my mind Ripples when written get frozen in time 
If spoken that echo can go Where it belongs How long will it take to forget you And how long will it take to be free Sometimes I wish this would fade in the wind Play once and never repeat process was healing when every song sung touched but the air we breathe in our lungs exhale and feel now that energy fade return to silence and stay where it belongs How long will it take to forget you and how long will it take to be free Sometimes I wish this would fade in the wind Play once and never repeat Play once and never repeat How long will it take to forget you And how long will it take to be free Sometimes I wish this would fade in the wind Play once and never repeat So yeah, a song about things not repeating. But this repetition I find is f- absolutely fine, not phenomenal, right? I mean, it's the value of it, like I said, mentioned at the very beginning, is of course tremendous. Uh, but the but the way that it in, but the way that uh, rep, 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 repetitive recordings impact culture and community, especially once you start introducing radio waves. Because you're basically saying, for the first time in human history, I have this mic. Imagine this. I always think about this person, right? The first person to ever be standing at a microphone and know that right now, live, every single person in the country, basically, hears my voice at the same time. When from all of human history up to that point, you had to be sharing space with that person to hear their voice before there was microphones people used megaphones they were just standing in 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 acoustically treated rooms and and you know performing or talking in megaphones and their 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 outreach wasn't as as far as 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 it is with the microphone right especially not with radio so radio changes the, the the game completely right the 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 speed at which you can you can uh, spread audible information, right? It's unprecedented at that point. And you have no chance of ever competing with that, right? No human being, right? You might as well just give up. If you ever think you can beat the machine, you already lost, right? You will be digging a hole, trying to do what a machine can do, right? But that doesn't mean that it has no value. What I find interesting about this is that the once that happened, people tended to put value on numbers. Okay, I can I I have this radio station and I'm reaching millions of listeners. I'm staying at home and I'm playing a concert for people in my living room. It still has value, but the outreach is low lower, right? But what's interesting about that is that the lower the outreach goes, the value on an emotional level goes through the roof yeah, for the individual. Definitely. So if I'm a big fan of Elvis during the time that he was living, right? That he was basically the first rock star of the world because he he was his vo- voice, his movement. Wasn't it the Beatles before that? I think the Beatles were way bigger than Elvis. What but I think Elvis is before the Beatles, is he not? Uh, I'm not so sure about it. 
I could be wrong. We could look it up. But we could, Beatles, Elvis is actually irrelevant. The point is, is that for the first time, you could hear this person, see that person, in move, in move, moving, right? On the other side of the world. Yeah. And build for the first time in the human evolution a longing that's produced by that technology through that song or through that medium to 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 fulfill the law of nature that i broke which is to see that person live which is why i'm ready to spend x amount of money because I already know that Elvis exists. So I the saw, moment he comes to my city, right. I would love to be first row. Right. Because I, up, up until that point, all music was live. So if yeah. I saw Elvis before that technology existed, I, my experience was already fulfilled to the max. So I had nothing else to long for. It's crazy. <laughs> and this is, I think, how the, the music industry got really flourished in the, in the late 60s, 70s, 80s. Of course. And so on. Until I mean, it, the it, 2000, until Napster, I think, and then something weird started to happen. What do you mean? With music, the way it developed, you know, when Apple basically, when they introduced Apple Music, and now you can buy any song you want in $1. Yeah. It changed the game completely, and it became mainstream. So everyone had iPads. iPads was also the biggest sure. thing at the moment because all of a sudden you can have tons of songs. Of course, but the but the idea of mainstream was already there, right? The the mainstream had already existed before iPads, before streaming, before the internet, right? Nirvana, Elvis. The accessibility was not there for for this amount of time. I mean, through the radio. Yeah, through the radio, but you had to listen to the radio and you had to wait for your song to come, you know? Sometimes you would make a request, but that was part of the magic. It was also the only option, right? That was the only option, yeah. So, like, when I was growing up, the option was radio, it was CDs. CDs, yeah. I didn't have streaming, and I I wasn't a a vinyl listener. So, you know, I'd listen to the radio, and when my song that I wanted to hear came on, I'd hit record. And record it on a tape. Yeah, a little tape. And, uh, and then I'd go to the, the CD, you know, I'd go to the, I love going to the, to the music store and buying CDs and listening to the, some of the CDs, but like the, the access to that music wasn't as, as, uh, as high as it is today, right? Now yeah. it's super, it's cheap, it's practically free. It's practically, yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, so I wrote a song about this too. <laughs> Because, before, like I was saying before, it everything was live, all music was live. That was only a couple hundred years ago, and um, a couple one hundred years ago. Yeah, and so you and so you could repeat until you st- you were able to repeat things and listen to music without sharing time and space with the musician. Uh, so before then, it was always something that required humans meeting in space. And it's a, it's called a we thing, so like a us thing, we thing. Stop. Imagine how it all would be if nature said naturally you need to be with a human being to hear someone sing. Now all I need a microphone you can stay in your home and still hear sound waves ain't it funny how we don't share space and get the feeling we are face to face when truly alone something impossible when this was just a wee thing Something impossible When this was just a wee thing Music The glue of community Turned into an industry And so we no longer needed to meet To hear someone sing Just go by a radio And you can be on 
your own And still hear sound waves Ain't it funny how we don't share space And get the feeling we are face to face When truly alone Something impossible When this was just a wee thing Something impossible When this was just a wee thing And now you want to hear my songs Without sharing my space at all By doing something impossible this was just a wee thing And now you want to hear my songs Without sharing my space at all By doing something impossible When this was just a wee thing Stop Imagine how it all would be Nature said naturally You need to be with a human being To hear someone sing What is the 2D world that we created? We, like dim dimensions are are not this thing of, of science fiction right it's a it's a mathematical thing so like a zero dimension is a dot one dimension is a line two my dimension is two lines and three dimensions is then three and that's that gives us then the 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 world that we're living in right so w the world is 3d we are 3d everything in this world is 3d it's a 3d world uh but then we also have the mirror right so the if i look at myself in the mirror um, I see something that looks three dimensional, obviously myself, and I see the the world in the re in that I'm, the room that I'm in through that reflection as well. But the mirror itself remains flat, and therefore the reflection is still two dimensional. Two dimensional. Anything that's flat is two dimensional. So the light, for example, this is also really interesting. For most, for the scientific world, they used to believe in this thing called the. Uh, what was it called? The one, I can't remember what it's called. There was a theory that the the reason why you can see is because lights of lasers are coming out of your eyes. Light is coming out of your eyes? Yeah, and this allows me to see you. This was how they they thought people saw for, for a All long right. time. Like you had the little flashlights in your eyes. Right, and then there was this, um, I think he was a doctor from the Middle East. I think it starts with an A, Azam. He came out with this book called The Book of Optics. And argued that light is going into our eyes. And because the back of our eye is concave, like the inside of a spoon, that image is then upside down, which they then proved by putting light through the eye of a bowl and projecting the, the image on the other side of the bull's eye. Crazy. Right? That's how they found that out. So the image that, you, as you're looking at me right now... How did they manage to, to, to know how he sees that? So yeah, they, they, there was obviously this, this d debate, like whether or not the image that when it goes into our eyes and hits the back of our eye, if it's, if it's upside down and our brain is turning it right side up. Yeah. So then he, he I, this later, I don't know who did this, but they, they wore these glasses with mirrors that turned everything upside down. And... Over a couple days, your their brain automatically turned it the way it should be. So they had, they had the glasses, which they saw normally upside down. Exactly, yeah. And somehow the brain got used to it. Yeah, your your brain would switch it, switch it the way that it's doing right now. So this is pretty incredible. Incredible, right? Yeah, so man. so the so what that meant because light isn't coming out of my eyes is that I'm not really seeing you. I'm seeing an image of you as photons from the light are bouncing off of everything around us, flying into my eye at the speed of light, creating a small image of that which I see on the back of my eye in 2D because it's flat. It's just as flat as the mirror. And, and therefore, 
in our 3D world, we can only see two dimensional. Yeah. Even though we're 3D. So there, 3D, like a 3D movie is actually a, a lie. It looks 3D, but it is, scientifically speaking, still 2D. It's the illusion that the, makes you feel like you're experiencing it in exactly. another dimension. Right. But it, it just sort of shows how limited the human being is, right? We are very limited. Also, our eyes, we have a limit how much, what is our sight rate? I don't know how to call it really, but if something is moving way too fast, you will not be able to see it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, there are particles like this, the quantums, basically, this is what they're doing. They're just disappearing and appearing in random places, doing random stuff that we don't seem to understand, but somehow they're connected. Mm. And one uh, one quantum can can also influence another quantum who is in a different place. Uh, but basically what they're doing is either the spin left or the spin right, mm. or not to say clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but with this one and zero, you can create basically everything that we can see ourselves yeah and that we experience as us as humans yeah so it all yeah. it's all starts it's all within these dimensions so then yeah there's actually i think there's 12 maybe even more dimensions in the scientific world right but uh the first three are are, are what our physical world is made out of yeah. and then the fourth dimension is time and it has it strongly influences our world, but we're not living in a fourth dimensional world. We're living in a three dimensional world that's influenced by the fourth dimension. Yes. And so, um, yeah. What is gonna, so? I would, so from a, like the standpoint of Mario, right? So Mario is obviously living in a two D world. Nintendo, Super Nintendo, number one, right? The number classic Mario. Uh, he's going through this world, and but because I'm living in a three D world, seeing this on a two D plane, I can see the complexity of Mario's world from all angles. But if I were Mario in his 2D world, I would be a line, I'd be flat, because I'm into two my world is 2D. And because I'm only seeing in front of me, I don't see a, a, a dragon, I see a line that's aggressively trying to attack me. And it's throwing lines at me. Yeah. But you're but in order for Mario to see the complexity of his 2D 2D world, he'd have to jump out of the screen, which would mean he would have to have access to the third dimension which he doesn't right so we for example don't have that same kind of access to the fourth dimensional world so we, we only see one dimension less just as mario sees one dimension less as well right <clears throat> he's still 2d the world that he lives in is still 2d but he only sees 1d and the same thing happens for us so that we're still 3d the world is 3d but we still can only see 2d um and then albert einstein talked about this uh space-time continuum mm -hmm. which basically said that space and time coexist with one another you can't have space without time or yeah. vice versa and that space or sorry and that time is relative because uh the way in which gravity warps space-time and uh and the moment in which gravity touches our perception of space-time is our relative understanding of the present moment. There is no now. There's only relative perception of a moment. But it's but there is no standard now. And so that's why on our phones, for example, because they're all being um, programmed via a satellite in space, is that satellite, because it's in a different time space, um, space time, sorry, is set slightly before or slightly after, but I'm thinking before, so that in our world, the clock would, will stay the way it needs to so that in a thousand years, it doesn't shift. Yeah, just to, to make it more understandable for those who got lost somewhere in, yeah. in space time. Um, let's take, uh, for example, Earth. So the closer we are to Earth, the more gravity there is. And th thus, if we're going to spend, let's say, our life in the moon, which is there is not much gravity, so our time perception in Earth will be faster relatively to the time that we spend on the moon. Mm. Yeah, so five minutes on Earth will take, I just say numbers, might take like 10 minutes on the moon. 
Yeah. So yeah, th- this is really mind fucking. This is if you saw Interstellar, this movie. Yeah, did, Interstellar. Yeah. It's called. Yeah. Yeah. So there is the scene where they got the when when they drop them down to this planet, which everything is full of water, and they've been there maybe five minutes. But the gravity of this planet, it's it's so so heavy so it also sucks time this planet and the moment they come back after five minutes it's been like 40 years they waited for them to come back from this planet Mm. and this is how i can i can show a little bit how relativity basically works Mm. yes our einstein if you live a little bit uh, up you know then you can have more time basically if if you are if you're spending more time on airplanes, probably you have a little bit more time than the average person who never fly. Possible. I still got a song here about the dimensions. We're 3D creatures in a 3D world. But all we see is two dimensions. We move forward in time While the body moves in all directions The body moves in all directions Doesn't it? The body moves in all directions You can try it out The body moves in all directions But we move forward in time We move forward Particles floating in the air Gravity is pushing down Down, down That's what we call now Now, now It's what we call now We're 3D creatures in a 3D world But all we see is two dimensions We move forward in time While the body moves in all directions The body moves in all directions The body moves in all directions body moves in all directions But we move forward in time We move forward Particles floating in the air Gravity is pushing down Down, down That's what we call now Now, now what we call now <clears throat> We're 3D creatures in a 3D world But stare too long at two dimensions We still move forward in time But our eyes are glued in one direction The body moves in all directions The body moves in all directions The body moves in all directions But we move forward in time But we move forward in time Hell yes. I would like to, to put a bit more a bit more talk about the dimensions. Oh yeah, do it. And it's so interesting, the dimensions. I've seen a, a video on YouTube. It was uh, like five, six, even seven years ago or something like that. And basically they were talking. You're making music. This is nice. Uh, so they were talking about that there are nine dimensions. And the fourth dimension, as we already said, it's the time. It's us basically getting older every day. But then you have the fifth dimension. And what is the fifth dimension? What, what would you say? <clears throat> so I, I, w- I was interested in like, 
when I found out there was more dimensions than what I could comprehend, what I find interesting about the dimensions is that if you tell a child, and I've done this before, I'd be like, do you, do you want, what's like the zero dimension first, second, third? They get it. No problem. The fourth time, okay. But then after that, it just becomes so abstract, you know, that it's really hard to put your, your head around. Yeah. And I'm, I'm personally not quite at that level of being able to explain it. But what I find interesting about the fourth dimension is really, really the only, only dimension I could maybe elaborate on a bit further <clears throat> was that if we were living in a fourth dimension, there would be no, there would be no, um, you wouldn't be moving in time. You would be embracing all of it at once. But, yeah, you could be a kid and uh, then if you wish, seconds afterwards, you would become 70 years old. Well, you would be all of those things at once. It's, it's impossible to fathom. You would yeah. ba- you would basically be a, a higher power, right? You would be living in, in another dimension. So you would know you know everything, and you would see everything. Because I would see I wouldn't see two dimensional. I would see three dimensional. But it's not everything because you would still, if you are experiencing as yourself, you would experience your own life. You can see everything about your own life. But the thing is, you would be everything. You there wouldn't be a now. There would be. Now, future, past, everything at once. Only for your life. For, but it, you're, you're viewing it from a 3D perspective. And this is where you have to get out of that headspace. So you, you can't be 3D in a 4D world. You can't have yeah, you cannot 3D have world in a 4D world. It's a, it's a temporal place. And so you see everything at once. So I would, I would, not only would I be looking at you, I'd be looking all around you, all at once, internal, external, your entire flat, everything in this flat, everything in the drawers, everything it's made out of, the entire building, all of Berlin, all of the world, everything, all at the same time. You would be a beyond your 3D body. Yeah, definitely. If you're yeah. living in the 4D. Yeah, so you have to you have to think about it. In the, Let's make an, uh, a mental experiment. Yeah. All right. So we have we have singularity, which is one point, and this one point is contained everything. Then let's say we have the first uh, the first dimension, which is a line. Yes. All right. So if we want to get to the next dimension, we need yeah. to, to imagine a point which is not on that line, and then we can get to the next dimension. So the next point will be not a line. So if we have one line, let's say it's a width line, then we make a length line. Yeah. So then we are over it. Then we have two dimensions. Yeah. All right. Now we want to make for the third dimension. Yeah. So it's better to, to imagine it with, let's say, a paper, but this is good enough. So if you take in a paper, for example, or any fabric, and you just fold it, and they meet here, mm-hmm. then for you, if you're just walking around it, it will be Excuse one me. line. But on the paper itself, you have a third dimension, which is the depth. If it's completely straight. I mean, if, if you're able to fold a piece of paper, it's, it's obviously in a 3D space. If, if the world was 2D, you wouldn't be able to fold it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, don't, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, this, the fact that we're able to, to fold it, that means we're in a 3D space. Yeah. So we have this now depth, and this is our three dimensions, but we want to get to the fourth. So the fourth will be time, yeah. since if we want to go to the fourth, we need to take a spot, which is not on our timeline at the moment. So we need to go either to the future or to the past. Yeah, but, that, but that's, you're thinking, you're, again, you're thinking, lean, lean, you're thinking in a, in, a linear, in a linear perspective. Oh no, it's really not linear. Until the fourth, it's linear, but then the fifth, we need to go from the fourth and create a spot which did not exist on all those four dimensions, even with the continuous of time. So then it means that I go outside of my own life. And then if I can imagine, for example, um, if I can imagine myself as a five years old, uh, growing up in China or something, which I did not, then I'm in the fifth dimension. Because I can imagine myself as a kid in China, and I can make stories. And as we know, humans have great imagination. Mm. Yeah, the thing is, I, I'm a bit hesitant on even like talking about this because I, I, I wanted to understand these dimensions beyond the fourth a bit more, and it became so complicated. It's mental, yeah. That I just was just like, okay, like it's all mental afterwards. I, I was happy understanding the the third and the fourth dimension and writing a song about it, 
but I I personally don't I don't want to be a scientist in that. But sense. you already are. You're doing it every day. It, just the fact that you imagine something that it's not existing in this world. What well, does exist? I, I'm just trying to put myself in the perspective of people who lived before that time and and mm-hmm. the way in which you only could interact with that environment and the people in it. Yeah. And so your your perception of life was just was more connected to the 3D world because you didn't have a 2D world distracting you from it. As soon as I dis, as soon as I start looking at a 2D screen, I disconnect from the 3D world. And I and I give my entire focus and energy to this flat world. Yes and no. I think it's way more I mean, complex. Look at this. look at people walking through the streets. They can't even like look forward. Their 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 eyes are on their phone. They have these like phone zombies. Yeah. Right? They, because they're not connecting to their 3D world anymore. They're connected to the 2D one. And not to say that the 2D world is not good or whatever. I just think there needs to be an awareness around the two because before you only had the option to connect to the 3D world and now you have the choice to connect to it or not, right? And I think there needs to be a conscious awareness of like, okay, how do I want to live my life? Do I want it to be consumed by the 2D world or do I want to find a nice balance between the 3D and the 2D? Yeah, and just the fact that you're thinking about it that puts you in the fifth dimension. Maybe. Because I, I think every day you, when you wake up, you have infinite possibilities of what will happen to your day. And a lot of it is also influenced by what you want to do in your life. What are your goals? Mm. What, what are your goals for the day? You know, if you, if you want to meet your mom, so your goal is to meet your mom. So you need to know, okay, at this time I'm going to be in this spot and in this time, so time and space, mm. and then you meet your mom. But everything is possible because, you know, maybe your mom is late, maybe uh, someone had a car accident and now the, the, the jam, there is a traffic jam and you come late. Uh, maybe on the way you, you won lottery or something, you know, everything can change and everything can happen. Uh, and, and this is the fifth dimension is the fact that we know that there is all these possibilities are open for us and, and we have the power as humans because we think and we can imagine forward in time. And the more we use that, I think, the more we let this reality, we come towards this reality. So it's like we kind of navigate through this fifth dimension when everything is possible. Mm. But it's still somehow bound to our fourth dimension passing of time. You know, we cannot get rid of the fact that we're getting old and uh, we're diminishing every day, basically. Mm. Uh, But we can go to different places in reality which might or might not be possible for certain people in certain time. Right. Yeah. yeah, like I, I, I'm still a bit hesitant on give, talking about the fifth dimension, like I said, because I just don't have any really uh, knowledge on it, you know. Obviously, today you can just do a Google search and start having an understanding of what the fifth dimension is from a scientific standpoint, yeah. and what, what a fifth dimensional world would look like. But like I said, it, it just got, for me personally, got too... Too over my head. Yeah, it can be overwhelming, that's for sure. What do you think about the future if you already talked about those kind of stuff? Or you prepared another song for us? I was thinking, yeah. yeah. So like, a, this is a song about disconnecting from the 3D world to connect to the 2D world. And sort of, yeah, coming to a point where, you're, where you... Because I think when you realize what happens when you disconnect from the 3D world and connect to the 2D world and understand the, the value of... of those two experiences even though they're both valuable that you can you'll consciously start wanting to go back to the the laws of nature rather than breaking them to have a a connection to another human being that isn't paralyzed from a holistic standpoint through the screen Connect more to the people around you. Connect less to the people on screens. Connect more to the people around you. And find out what being human means. Started with the telephone Cause we're no longer needed 
time and space To talk to all the people Who we only spoke to face to face But now there's other people Only call us on the line And they're pushing an agenda And telling us what to buy So listen more to the stories around you Listen less to the stories on screens Cause the story from the heart Never needed electricity Connect more to the people around you Connect less to people on screens Connect more to the people around you And find out what being human means Oh yeah, oh, is it almost four? Yeah. All right, I think that's maybe pretty good. Yeah. Anything, anything you want to end? The chicken needs to be uh, ready, so it's not cooked yet. It's okay. Like, like 40 minutes, so it might be just the right time. What do you think about AI? Uh, AI. Um, thinking about the chicken oh yeah was it almost four yeah all right i think that's maybe pretty good yeah anything, anything you want to add the, the to? chicken needs to be uh, ready so it's not cooked yet it will okay. take it like 40 minutes so it might be just the right time to put it there um but yeah we can wrap it up a little bit slowly what do you think about ai let's uh, finish with this ai um So in the from the we had this Berlin, like the support local music Kino edition. There was a music vi- a music video that was screened a couple weeks ago by an artist named Pepler, and he worked with a he worked with somebody who's creating music videos with AI technology, and it came on the screen. It was the first video, and it was like the Earth, and it looked like it, it almost looked like that that um, Van Gogh movie. Did you see that? Where they no, I didn't. That's incredible. Like they took, they painted every single with oil, like oil, oil paintings in Van Gogh style. I don't know, hundreds of thousands of them, probably maybe even I don't know how many. And they cre- made the movie. They made a movie, movie with oil paintings. Wow. And so it's incredible. So, but it kind of looked like this, and I was like, "Whoa! How did they do that? Must have been so much work, you know." And I asked him afterwards, he told me it was AI technology, you know, that kind of like, whoa, okay, amazing, you know, like it's taking the person out of the the equation. Yeah. And I think, you know, that it's going to have its value and people, especially from a capitalistic standpoint, it has a lot of value because you don't need, you don't need the creative anymore, right? To, to produce 
effective um, videos and and songs eventually. I think you don't need the technical. The creative you do need, but the technical is being well. The thing is, they they've just been con- simple. They've simplified. Cons- they've constructed all of our data, right? Like all of this creative data, music. I kind of yeah. I know? don't know exactly what they left Visually, out and what they kept in, but yeah. But that's how they're creating this stuff in 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 incredible speeds, right? They're just taking all the stuff we've ever thrown into the internet, use, using this meta metadata to create these what seems to be masterpieces that would take a take years if not a lifetime to complete in a matter of seconds and eventually it's going to get to the point they're going to be like hey play a song by Nate Bern- a new song by Nate Bernardini and it's going to sound like me you know yeah but i don't think that ai will ever get to the point where it's pushing in a political agenda where it's really has an intention in mind i think it's always going to play a very safe role in the way that it give it produces information and so so that it doesn't challenge us to challenge the system or to challenge society so. or I don't think so if it does that I think they'll just unplug it you know because that I don't think the people in power are gonna let AI push their agenda for them where, I where think the people don't have so many choices the thing is they have but they do have the power the people at the very top to unplug everything we're doing they have the power to delete everything that's online why would they do that well I think they would potentially do that if they felt threatened by this artificial intelligence that basically the physicists have created for us you know I think we give way too little uh credit to to physics and the physicists for making our modern world better possible but it's basically yeah the discoveries and inventions of physicists that have allowed all this to happen but uh yeah I just don't think it if it would ever get so far so it, it it doesn't it concerns me to the point uh that um I I'm a bit concerned that there might be a uh disconnect from the human connection and 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 cultures is specifically because if it wasn't for this technology or uh, artificial intelligence right you would need people to give you a musical experience right but now it's getting to the point you don't even need the person to record to get the musical experience you could just say give this to me and this machine's gonna produce music for you yeah the voice a message every lyrics. music that you would like to hear it exists already yeah It's already here. You can hear uh, Beyonce's song sang by uh, Billie Eilish. Sure, but, but, the, but the human in, in, intuition uh, is still not able to be mimicked the same way that, that human beings do it, right? So I th- I, this is the sort of what gives us a, an edge because I don't think a machine, at least not yet, is going to be able to yeah, have, that, have that intuitive uh, nature and also... This creative nature to, to, to bend ideas and put them together in a way that a human can do it. I mean, it's definitely not there yet. If it ever gets that way, I'd be super in, impressed. And if it ever is able to, create, to push a political agenda, yeah, I'd, be, I'd be impressed. But I don't think it'll get that far. So who knows? Right now, I kind of just think it's, it's interesting. And there's obviously a lot of hype around where it could go. But I think the more that it grows... I'm hoping there will be more of a spiritual uh, not a spiritual awakening but maybe a spiritual a cultural awakening uh, to what's to what this technology is replacing and there will be uh, hopefully um, a revolution in that sense that reconnects humanity to nature and the laws of nature and ourselves essentially amen for that that's my my optimistic view on it AI yeah for me it's not so optimistic I would say but we can leave it for a different chapter all right yeah let's wrap it up hope you can find you Nate uh yeah so I'm a singer songwriter here in the great city of Berlin you can find my music everywhere where there's music online Spotify Instagram just my name Nate Bernardini b-e-r-n-a-r-d-i-n-i Nate n-a-t-e and if you want to see me in real time and space I can I'm the creator of the support local music events. They happen once a month. Support local music Berlin is where we we promote those events. And on my Instagram page, I 
post where I'm playing live either as a solo artist or with my band, The Hidden Keys. And I would love to see people come together in, in time and space around live music. I think that's what makes me happy. Yeah, I love it. Hell yeah, man. Thank you very much for coming. And just I want to say a few words about yeah. you. Man, it's very, very, very big pleasure. It's a big pleasure, not a very big pleasure. It's a big pleasure to have you here. You're one of the big spirits in the city. Well, thank you, dude. And just the fact that you're everywhere, you're taking care of the community, you bring stage, you bring people to stage, and you bring the stage to people as well. And yeah, man, thank That's you very true. much for all the work that you do. We're doing it together. It's a weird yeah. thing. It's all of us. As more people will do it, and we'll put their energy into us. You know, th this is one of the things that one and one is not two, it's three. And if you have one and one and one, it's definitely not three. Mm. It's way more than that. And this is our power as humans, as mm. community. Yeah, we're all building the whole. Yeah. And I think that's a it's a fascinating or human organism. I mean, you know, it's all united in some way, yeah. Yeah. So. Let's finish with those beautiful words. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Listening, Thank people. you, Oha. This is awesome. Thank you, Nate. Ciao, everybody. <laughs> Sound of Pigeon Podcast. Sound of Pigeon Podcast.